We're delighted to have Michael Wignall here, um, the CTO of Microsoft. Michael is responsible for all aspects of UK technology strategy at Microsoft, including supporting the implementation and use of technology by commercial and public sector organisations and acting as a catalyst for digital transformation. He joined Microsoft in 2008 and has worked in a number of roles, including as government industry manager responsible for solutions and partners, and in the public sector teams for Microsoft Dynamics. Prior to joining Microsoft, Michael worked as CTO in the telecoms uh, tech startup space after emigrating from Australia, where he, where he was a high voltage systems engineer. Love it. Welcome, Michael. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> it's great to see on the panel, uh, we have Rolf Bragg. Hello, Rolf. Uh, senior partner at Radom on the secondment to the open banking implementation entity. Rolf's career began at the London Stock Exchange before he was lured into investment banking. I love that you were lured, by the way. <laughs> As technical architect at Societe Generale, Rolf crafted a globally distributed mission-critical pricing and execution platform for retail and professional finance clients. Moving into the Royal Bank of Scotland in a senior role, Rolf led the IAM architecture team the team delivered a, mod, uh, sorry, a modem platform for RBS, which ensured the business is able to quickly adapt and embrace transformational changes like PSD2 and the open banking initiatives. As the identity and security architect for Open Banking Limited, Rolf is very active in the design and the delivery of the UK's national open banking and PSD2 programme, as well as acting as Radom's primary representative to the Open ID Foundations, uh, Financial API Working Group, and other international standards bodies. Welcome, Rolf. Great and varied careers to see here. Ewan, Ewan Willis, Policy Director. Lovely to see you here for UK Finance. Uh, Ewan joined the banking industry with BBA in July uh, 2015, joining as Policy Director in the retail team, with a particular focus on the ongoing changes to payment regulations and, co uh, and conduct issues, both in the UK and the EU. Over time, his portfolio has included ever more work looking at how the development of digital identity and KYC solutions could help both consumers and industry. Before joining the BBA UK Finance, Ewan worked as a policy director for ACCA, a global membership body for accountants leading the organization's influencing and research activities. Welcome, Ewan. We're joined also by Phil Allen, VP EMEA for Ping Identity. So Phil Allen has spent the last 18 years helping the world's largest organizations become more agile and gain competitive advantage through the successful implementation of security and identity management frameworks focusing on the business benefit rather than solely on IT security. Most recently at Ping Identity, Phil has been working on the PSD2 and open banking initiatives to modernize banking across Europe. Uh, as well as providing a solution which is relevant to the broader financial industry. Welcome very much, Phil. Delighted to introduce Nick Cayley. Hi, Nick. VP of Financial Services and Regulatory EMEA at Forge Rock. With 20 years' experience covering all aspects of information security, Nick Cayley has had advised global clients in the industry and government on security strategy and the operational capabilities that enable organisations to protect their most valuable assets. Nick is responsible for financial services and regulatory with a focus on guiding organizations to deliver successful outcomes beyond compliance with GDPR, PSD2, and open banking. Welcome. So, uh, Rolf, I'd love to hear your perspective to start the panel. How did we get here? Where are we now? And what does 2018 look like towards an open banking trust framework? Thank you. So there are three uh, fantastic questions. So uh, how do we got here? Um, firstly, all this kicked off, as you heard from this morning, um, by a Competition and Markets Authority mandate, which basically said to all of the banks, look, we know PSD2 is coming. We've tried you switch. We've tried to stimulate competition um, in other ways. But now, boys, you're going to have to get together, build an API, come up with a common standard, and uh, deliver in very, very, very aggressive time frames. So how do we get to where we are, which is a go live, uh, so standards created, an identity solution um, stood up and running and made available 
um, for both banks and TPPs and a go live date of the 13th of January um, when we were pretty much going from a standing start on the 2nd of February. Well, the only reason we managed to deliver in the timeframes that we did was the great work the OpenID Foundation Financial API Working Group had been already doing. So the FAPI Working Group had recognised that um, uh, OpenID Connect, uh, as it stood and as everybody was familiar with, wasn't good enough or appropriate for all use cases. So there's a series of working groups um, that the OpenID Foundation funds and uh, promotes, which I, I highly encourage everybody to get involved in, that looks at how do we profile uh, this technology? How do we secure this technology? How do we framework, you know, tailor it um, for our needs? And that was very, very lucky and very, very fortuitous that the read-write specification, which was the security standards, um, were just about to be published. But that was great. But we had a, a definitive you know, standard that we could have used and we, um, that we did look at that said, this is gold plating financial services APIs. But we had a challenge. We didn't have the time and all the banks didn't have the infrastructure and the services and none of the vendors that are represented on this panel had actually implemented all features of um, the OpenID Connect base protocol, let alone all the enhancements that have been laid on over the years with the Financial API Working Group. So how do we get to the, to the standards? We threw everybody in a room, everybody that was willing to help, and that included the OpenID Foundation, Ping, ForgeRock, Microsoft, uh, a whole bunch of TPPs, security experts from across uh, the industry, um, and we pretty much didn't let anybody leave until we had come up with a, a series of standards. Uh, in all seriousness, it was done over a very short period of time, a few weeks, a lot, a lot of workshops uh, that went into it, um, and that resulted in the standards that you see today. And that is the Open Banking UK standard for, uh, that, that allows banks to promote and serve resources uh, out to the community. So the standards consist of how do you deliver APIs? What are the identities that are required in order to secure those AP APIs? Recognition that EIDAS and all the other provisions in PSD2 are only just part of the jigsaw. Um, and then on the other side of the coin you have is what is it we're going to try and serve? Financial data, account information, balances, transactions. So it's really been broken down into three parts and all three of them were progressed at pace uh, and at speed. Um, where are we today? Uh, the standards are available, the working groups are available, the specs are available. We highly encourage everybody to get involved, read them, implement them. Um, and hopefully on the 13th of January when we all go live and PSD2 uh, officially uh, comes into law and the Competition and Markets Authority's mandate forcing the nine biggest banks in the UK to have delivered something um, or that, to, to, you know, the specifications for defined by Open Banking by the 13th of January, um, it's going to be the start. It'll be the start of a, of a journey. Who knows what 2018 is going to bring? Who knows what new innovative uh, applications uh, are going to be built on top of this data and built on top of these APIs? Um, for open banking itself, there's a whole program of work that's now being defined to look at what do we do next? What APIs need to be created? What new standards need to be uh, evolved? And again, that work is being done in strong collaboration with uh, industry, the banks, um, security veterans here, and of course, the OpenID Foundation and OIX. Great, fantastic. And where can people find these resources and specs? Uh, www.openbanking.org.uk. Fantastic. Did you get all that? <laughs> <laughs> Good. Thanks very much, Ralph. Great to, great to hear your work as well. Thank you. Ewan, I understand uh, that I'd love to, firstly, can you tell us about the work that you're doing with the OIX? Certainly, yeah. Um, and we've done a few projects with the OIX with various partners over the last few years. We were involved in the, uh, the Barclays FCA. Um, OX and, and GDS work looking at uh, the use of a Norwegian identity to open up an account in the UK. Uh, that resulted in two projects and then more recently um, some work with PwC through OIX and again with GDS. Um, we found uh, actually the OIX program, the ethos behind it, the uh, open access route that OIX um, really has embedded within it, tremendously helpful. The reason being really is that innovation in a competitive and heavily regulated space, I think, um, is very challenging. We've seen this uh, in lots of other areas. It, it takes some momentum, some degree of trust, and, and particularly a great degree of openness to drive forward collaborative change in that kind of heavily competitive space. I think it's something that the pa Payment Strategy Forum has, has tackled very well through the use of the forum and the regulator using that forum to drive through suggested change in the payments industry. And I think OIX can play a similar role. I think it helps to 
build trust. I think it helps to provide a good framework for collaborative research to come forward. And so we're quite keen to, to continue to work very closely with OIX. Can you also tell us about UK finance rights in the past? Uh, yes, yeah, certainly. Um, so UK finance, I guess, we're, yeah, we're still quite new. Um, so it may be that a number of you haven't heard of who we are, I guess. Um, I mean, I started out my banking career as, as such as it's been, um, working in the policy team at the BBA. Um, that morphed into UK finance uh, as early as July. And we are one of five trade associations. I think we were the largest one, but um, we were joined by UK Cards, by Payments UK, uh, Financial Fraud Action, um, Asset-Based Finance Association, and the Council of Mortgage Lenders. Um, so we, we have a lot of crossover. We had a lot of crossover in our memberships, but I think each organization had a particular focus, a particular skill set. And, and some unusual members or less uh, common members, I guess. Having brought those together, being in the same place, we were very collaborative and, and cooperative before that. Having a, a single vision of where we're going, I think having that mix of skills co-located with, um, I guess, a, a common membership has actually brought great strength to the organisation uh, and a real focus and actually has enabled us to, to question some of the things that we did before and some of the ways that we worked. So it's been a, a, a new broom slightly. Um, I guess the only risk that that carries is that, and again going back to the Payment Strategy Forum which is a really interesting set of initiatives, having a, uh, I think in the past perhaps when the government or regulators have tried to pin something on the industry, it's been pinning the tail on a number of different donkeys that are always in movement. And now there's just one big donkey sat in the middle, so it's easy to pin it on. So, Hard to miss it, right? <laughs> exactly. So uh, I, I think we are, we're a great delivery organisation. I think our, our focus is not on doing sort of loudspeaker um, lobbying and so on. It's about identifying and collaboratively identifying and then perhaps driving forward change in the industry, which I think is much needed. And it, it gives us a really exciting remit. Um, but yeah, we are that big donkey in the middle of the room. <laughs> Thank you very much. What can we build on from other trust frameworks that already exist? Hmm. This is a really interesting one. We've been looking at identity in, in various guises for a number of years, and, and actually that work has, has only increased recently and quite substantially. So we're doing a lot of work trying to um, get a real vision for the industry in terms of what the finance industry needs and perhaps what other industries need as well, what the customers the consumers actually need. We talk a lot about customers, but I think we still, we talk about customers, we name check them, and then we revert back to a, a technology conversation or a standards conversation. Actually, we need to put them, their experience and their needs in the center. Um, I think a lot of other schemes have done that, but th there are some great identity schemes out there. There are schemes that are wider than identity, and I think, to be honest, the US and the UK are almost outliers now in the developed world as not having something very close to market or actually in the market, which, um, has involved banks and government working collaboratively to deliver something, which I think is, is, is telling. And so I think we do want to be involved. What I sense is, from my perspective, you know, two years ago when I started at, at what was then BBA, identity was, was on a long list, a very long list, and towards the bottom for a number of banks. Not all, but I think for a number. That's risen up very rapidly. In the last six months, I've seen a real sea change. But what we haven't got is that common understanding of really what the industry needs. So I think we're learning from those other schemes. There are some great learning points around sort of the need for frequency of use of wide utility, of wide reliance upon whatever the scheme is. It needs to be as frictionless and as vis invisible as possible for, for that hockey stick graph to really take place. And I think so we've got great learning there. What we need to do is get the understanding and a common understanding across the banks quite quickly as to what that solution, that ideal solution or solutions might be. I don't think we've quite got that yet. And so we're a bit tentative in choosing Betamax or VHS, whatever it might be. I think we need to get a common view in the industry. And so we're working very hard to look at what that right solution might be. And I don't think it's just identity. I think it's a KYC data solution. Absolutely. Uh, so the Open Banking Trust Framework um, was designed uh, deliberately um, to be able to go global. Um, it's at the moment focused very much on the, uh, the UK uh, implementation and looking after the UK banks, but there is absolutely no reason that trust framework, which is now trusted by all of the UK ASPSPs to define not just their business-to-business -business relationships or accreditation of processes for finance, but that model could be extended to any business, any area, any group, any structure. The trust framework that's being delivered there uh, and the asset that is now being used was, uh, it is phenomenally valuable to not just the CMA9, but to any other sector or any other bank that comes along. Um, this topic's always been about e economics of identity, and no one's really asked us yet, how do we pay for open banking going forward? 
It's a great question, it's still being worked on. Um, but what was recognised was that the value of putting each of the banks, putting money into a single pot to solve their B2B and their computer to computer and their software to software identity problems resulted in an incredibly valuable service that massively lowers the barrier of entry for TPPs coming on board. It's essentially a federated identity provider, but for business identities. So it can be done and it can be delivered in a relatively short period of time, but it does require, uh, and it can be uh, you know, delivered purely just by looking at it from an economics of scale point of view. If I've got three organisations that all need to do exactly the same thing as was discussed earlier, why not get together and say, I'm a bank. What I do is banking. And what I want to do is deal with my customers. I don't want to know about business to business identity. It's a sunk cost. Let's all get together and create a service and create a standard and create a, a utility and a framework that we can all contribute to that will solve that problem for us. And that's essentially what the open banking directory is. I think it's got to go beyond just open banking. I mean, we're, we're at the, this point now where uh, organisations have been, as an example, issuing customer numbers or some form of customer identification uh, to, to the customers so that they can manage their internal processes. So they're going through some aspect of verification of who that person is and then issuing something that's completely arbitrary and ultimately useless to other organisations that helps them through their back-end processes. And that is something that has to change now. And, and you know, I, I, I totally agree. All the work that's been done um, by, by open banking is, is incredible. And, you know, working across EMEA, you see that, that the UK is, is actually a long way ahead from an open banking perspective. Yes, the Nordics have been working with Bank ID for a very, very long time, and we understand that. And, and people are used to using that. But as, as this extends out and people start to see these APIs being used for things that go beyond just banking, and, and as you start to operate, for example, you want to purchase uh, airline tickets, and the airline ticket can take, that, uh, t take, take the funds directly from your, your account as a TPP, they're also going to be having APIs that are interacting with hotels, with car hire companies, with trips that you may want to go on. And, and we're moving out of an era that is, that is going to be closed into an open banking era that then becomes that is open everything. And with that, there has to be an ID that is able to, to transcend all of those different industries. And it could be moving into health industries. It could, it could be, be moving into leisure, anywhere else. And I think that becomes a really, really important aspect to take it beyond open banking. In terms of the... What can be learned? I think there's a lot for other trust frameworks that are being developed right now to learn from open banking. I think to Phil's point, you know, just in terms of the looking across Europe, particularly as PSD2 comes into force and what's being defined there, the work that's been done by FAPI, I think the, the open standards, the way that those are being implemented, the specifications, I think the focus needs to be on interoperability. Uh, because the outcomes for individuals, citizens, patients, consumers, customers, all the users of the various services is dependent upon how that is interoperable, particularly when you get into you know, the way that our, our society works. We travel everywhere, we're expecting to use services as we, as we need to in different environments. So interoperability, I think, is key, and I think from that point, it's really looking at what open banking has, been, has created. Uh, human, what's key to getting a trust framework adopted? Firstly, you need uh, wide utility, I think, which I think for open banking there's certainly going to be that. Um, I think you need it to be as frictionless as possible for the end user, obviously, and I don't think that's always been the case in all schemes. Um, the bit that I think potentially might be missing, I mean, I, I had a, a family dinner at, um, the weekend just past, and I actually use it as a little bit of a sort of a vox pox. Pops. And, I, and I asked, I asked uh, people around the table, there are three generations, um, what they knew about open banking, and it was open what? Um, PSD2, PS what? Um, and so on. And then I talked a little bit about the utility that these things might bring to individuals. And to be honest, they didn't have a Scooby-Doo. Uh, now, these people are not very close to that. I, I occasionally talk about my work, so they might have heard it and, you know, being referenced and so on. But I think that there is, you know, having spent the last 20 or 30 years telling people not to share their data or be very wary who you agree to share your data with, to suddenly say there's some great things that can happen if you share your data um, <laughs> it is a big challenge. I think it's a big education challenge. And I'm not sure 
that we've necessarily engaged with that challenge sufficiently yet. And that may be ultimately a sticking point. I mean, it's not necessarily exactly a trust framework, but we've had contactless technology for 10 plus years. And it's only in the last couple of years that we've seen the hockey graph tick go up. And it's interesting to try and identify what the factors were. And I, I think it, it is about confidence. It's about comfort. It's about knowing about it. It's about maybe actually making it more invisible sometimes. But I don't know that we are, as a citizenry at the moment, confident in what we understand about our identity, our data rights, how our data is used, who buy, and in what manner. The fact that we're suddenly going to have a lot more control with GDPR coming up, I think, again, is not really hit the public psyche in any kind of way. And I think we're at a point now where perhaps we do need to have a, a wider conversation. Just on that, just on that topic, uh, you don't have to engage, uh, engage, but how many people bank with Lloyds, HSBC or Barclays? Put your hands up. Now all of those three banks sent out their terms and conditions, how many people read them? <laughs> and how many people know that the open banking and provisions and third party delegated access were in there? I have to say that's the first set of T's and C's I have read recently. <laughs> <laughs> Only because I knew that that was going to be in there, so I wanted to see what was in there. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. Even amongst the, uh, the identity um, uh -huh. or the identity community, you, uh, the lack of, uh, you take for granted that things change. Nobody reads their terms and conditions. They come out every three, mo three months, but that was the first one in there that has some, some really systemic changes to how banks will treat your data on your request, yet, no one's really noticed, no one's really talking about it, though all the information is there. It's just not in a format that yeah. uh, really brings it home to us. The education's yeah. not there. Yet, overnight, all of our terms and conditions have changed. Yeah, I, th I, th I think there's one other thing that will drive the, uh, the adoption of this. And, and you know, if, if we, you said about contactless being, being around for a, for a long time. And it, certainly, if we, if we look in, you know, you know, in our close vicinity, Things like the Oyster card drove the adoption of contactless payments, you know, through w w with with credit and debit cards, because people actually got used to. Oh, there's a new way of doing this. I can prepay this. If, if someone if something goes wrong, it's not the end of the world for me. And it and it was absolutely adopted by the younger generation, you know. And I'm sure that there are still a number of of people who still go and buy a paper ticket and stick a paper ticket through those machines. And I think exactly the same thing will occur here. There are a large number of fintech organizations who are already changing the way that people are, are operating with them. You know, if you look at just the, the, the registration process of, of organizations such as Monzo, you know, they have, have tried to take that approach that this should be seamless, it should be able to be done in four minutes. It's still following the same traditional processes that KYC needs. It's not using, you know, verify as, as that process, which would, you know, give the same user experience. But people are now saying, actually, I'm happy to bank with this type of an organization. And I'm going to do that because this type of organization is going to allow me to make simpler purchases um, and, and provide APIs through to other organizations. And I think as that starts to get adopted by a new generation that's coming through, that in itself will give the level of confidence, and, and I totally agree with Nick, and trust that actually these technologies can be, can be used and you know the sky isn't going to come crashing down. There are still people out there who send checks. You know, I know it's quaint, but uh, it still occurs. <laughs> and those people will still continue to send checks for a little while. But as more and more people start to adopt just a new way of doing this, and there's the whole principle around you know competition in in this space, then that will just create the surge of momentum that may not happen in 2018, but will start to happen immediately following. What do you think the, the likelihood or the potential is for there to be a, an even deeper digital divide between young and old based on open banking? Because we see that with banking generally, whether it's online banking, app-based banking, all sorts of payment infrastructure and so on. I think open banking gives facilities that currently just do not easily exist in mm. the market. And I think some of the most valuable aspects of that are for, for older customers, potentially, and yet they are, by our research at least, the least likely to, to engage yeah, with that. Do you think uh, that's going to make it worse? I think that is a fact. Um, I think where, the, where, where things will change is if we take it outside of a consumer environment, because you know, as organizations, and, and it will typically be, I, mean, I hate to be 
overly generalist on this, but it'll typically be slightly older people who are working in TPP organizations, working in finance organizations, who are actually getting benefit by being able to have direct access to accounts. Uh, so as industry adopts it, then those people will gain that level of confidence that actually these APIs are here to work. They're using it not necessarily for their personal uh, aspects, but they're using it in a B2B environment. And as more and more people see that B2B environment operating correctly, then they will then adopt that into their personal mm -hmm. lives. And I think the same thing, you know, things happen with faster payments, et cetera. You know, uh, you know I'm sure people had, had questions over direct debit when they originally came out. But as organizations adopt it and people realize that actually, you know, if anyone's going to lose lots of money, it's going to be someone who has lots of money, which is typically going to be an organization uh, rather than uh, any of us, uh, certainly me. Um, so, so, you know, I think that will start to, to gen generate that, that level of adoption. Will the eldest communities adopt it? No. Maybe not. Well, I, I mean, I think I would add to that because I think we were both involved in a, in a very interesting project, which was government, you know, led blue badge, which I think showed that actually, you know, any individual can adapt to something mm -hmm. that is going to make it easier mm -hmm. for yeah. them. And I think it is the, the onus is on those that are innovating right now, be they in a bank, be they in a fintech, be they in a TPP, to really test out that innovation, that, that customer journey to ensure that that ease of use becomes something that just creates that adoption. I'm quite optimistic about that, both for the old and the young, um, and for the innovation and opportunity it represents, but also the threat potentially to existing biz business models. So you think about Alexa and the Amazon Echo in the home, mm. young people today are absolutely going, Alexa, order me some blueberries. Yeah. E Alexa, do this. Alexa, transfer some money to my friends. Alexa, what's the best account I should have optimize my um, banking. And AI for, for young people is there. And we're also seeing it though in older people for social care, mm -hmm. in the home, for, mm -hmm. um, for, for, for medical issues. So I think the adoption will happen much, much quicker. Um, I think trust frameworks though are core, because you need to make sure that if you're, if you're um, passing over responsibility therefore to a third party, um, that is done in a trusted way. And I think it is crossed to the earlier points around this is a worldwide issue and there's learnings to be had and it's cross industry, um, because you'll want to do it in payments and banking, but you'll also want to do it in healthcare, you want to do it in all different yeah. areas. We've got a question from Nick, thank you very much. Uh, Nick, I know that you've been working in an international perspective, so I'd love to um, hear from you in terms of um, what can we build on international experience? Yeah, so I, I, as I was saying with regards to the trust frameworks that, that we see being developed in other countries, I mean, I think, I think it's, um, there's, there's learnings all over in terms of the way that they're being adopted and how they're being applied within the real world. Um, I think it's fair to say that open banking, as has been expressed, is ahead in terms of you know, really taking the lead in, in, um, in bringing to bear the, the, the kind of capabilities or at least bringing to bear the specifications that allow those new capabilities to be developed. I think in, when you look around, uh, particularly across Europe, there is a lot of activity in terms of particularly within the banking community in actually recognizing that opening up our APIs right now uh, under the right conditions, really with the resources protected, knowing exactly who's coming in, doing what with that data is, is absolutely paramount. But I think we're, as we approach 2018, we're heading into, I think it would be fair to say, uh, uh, a year where we've never seen quite so much far-reaching regulation that, that is so demanding of organisations to be addressed. And absolutely, trust is written across every single regulation. So whether it's looking at open banking, PSD2, e-privacy, the GDPR, which is massive in its own right. And so I think it is important, you know, amongst international organisations and those of us that spend time internationally, you know, we're being asked for, you know, our opinion around the development of these new trust frameworks and to really rely upon what's already established as an open standard, as an industry protocol. Because if we end up in three years' time really with a spaghetti of, you know, various different specifications, 
that is going to really stifle adoption and innovation, which is exactly <coughs> what these, these regulations have really been delivered for. It may be what the regulations were intended with PSD2, but the, for those of you that are in payment services, uh, the absence of the regulatory technical specifications or the drafts that have been coming out for the regulatory technical specifications, unfortunately, aren't going to result in that nirvana. So that was one of the, the benefits of having the Competition and Markers Authority saying you must have a common standard, you must have a common API. And we took that very literally to say it to mean you must have not just a common set of resources, but you must have a common way of exposing those resources. Because in the absence of very, very strict common, a common standard, you are going to see spaghetti across Europe. Um, if you're lucky, you may see national bodies stepping up to the plate and saying, the Danish, we're going to copy open banking with a couple of tweaks. The French, we're going to have the STAT framework, um, which again, only defines the functional APIs, not the technical ones, so you're going to may have to break down 10 different doors, but once you're in there, you'll know everybody has their fridge in the same location. Um, I, I don't think we've gone far enough from a regulatory point of view. I know there's a lot of uh, different interest groups sort of uh, weighed in across uh, PSD2, and that's where government can help to shape, control, guide, because particularly when you are talking about breaking, uh, you know, changes, major changes to business models, trying to get everybody to willingly sign up to this is like trying to get turkeys to vote for Christmas. In a lot of cases, it's met with fear, resistance, uh, and outright, you know, negativity. And it's not till you get halfway down the journey that you start seeing these organizations say, hang on a minute, this is great. Everyone else is opening up all their data, and that means I can get access to that and potentially, you know, become more competitive. I can use identities, uh, access um, other banks' data. I now have been forced to revolutionise my ID, uh, our information systems, and at the same time, hey, I've now got to come up with a new Butte authentication mechanism for customers, which means that. I make my customers' experience better. I give them the ability to partner with who they want. I become compliant for, or com along the way, compliance for GDPR, PC2 Open Banking. And collectively, when you start bundling all these different programs together, it should ultimately put our banks, uh, or the banks, in a much better state, particularly in the UK. And uh, it was one of those, uh, but it does raise interesting points. And I think I didn't, uh, one of the gentlemen on a previous panel said, I, what happens when this all goes live and you've got the ability to digitally identify someone, automatically discover which bank's got the best uh, interest rate on their current account, which is one of the features of the UK's Competition and Markets Authority, but not PSD2. Uh, automatically open the bank account, transfer all my money to it. Uh, what does that do systemically? Is there a systemic risk yeah. problem here for global financial yeah. services? And uh, Radium, we wrote a, a, a white paper, it's on our website, we did this a year ago, that called out the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Individually, three of them were absolutely fantastic, but collectively, those four, without oversight, without rules of the road and regulation to say, uh, to, to apply a bit of game theory that says, what's good for you, what's good for me, what's good for Phil, what's good for Nick, uh, collectively, may be absolutely disastrous for all of us. And unfortunately, the regulation doesn't allow anybody to make any sort of opinions in that regard. So that's going to be some of the evolution for 2018, 2019. Interesting. I'd like to uh, close this panel by asking Michael a few questions on looking to future tech, if that's OK. What are the future technology innovations that are unlocking open banking, please? I mean, just continuing that, that point, in that scenario, you're thinking about a person making that decision because they've seen a website and they've seen something. In the future, absolutely, we're going to be delegating decision making to, to bots and artificial intelligence. Machines will make that decision for you. That's right. Um, and so if you trust the machine and you need an ethical framework about trusting that machine um, and you need appropriate way to identify it and, and have a framework for trust, um, you can have masses of the market moving automatically without actually making, they've consented to the machine doing that. Um, and if we don't think it's impacting our lives today, whoever watches Netflix and, and uh, you know, Amazon Prime and goes to the next recommended movie is seeing it today, right? You're getting prompted by it and your media choices are being determined by AI. Um, so I absolutely think that technology will impact it. And I was do almost doing buzzword bingo earlier around how many times blockchain came up and a couple of other things. I think there is uh, a number of technology areas that will be impacted in that space. I guess my overarching feel when I look at whether it's open banking or looking at these issues globally, and actually you, you introduced me as the CTO of Microsoft, I wish. I'm the CTO of Microsoft in the UK, um, so I, you know maybe one maybe, maybe one day. Team congratulations! Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I got a promotion cheers. out of that. Um, <laughs> is is we, we do look at the global perspective. We, we, the themes of today around uh, collaboration and standards are key, 
And I'm optimistic. When I talk to my peers globally, when I talk cross industry as well as banking, there is effort around standardization, that there is different disparity. Um, we're trying to make sure that we've got the technology platforms to allow that innovation to happen, to unlock it at a global scale in a secure and trusted way, and therefore lets all the cool businesses do the cool stuff they want to do after. So I'm, I'm generally pretty optimistic about what we're looking like in the future. I completely agree with you from the technology point of view, but to your point, when AI is making a lot of these decisions, what you've seen through every single global financial crisis since day, day dot is that the regulations lag behind. Yep. As AI and these new services become available, it's going to become critical that regulation is abreast of all of these changes and is thinking about and legislating for these uh, potential scenarios because the pace of innovation, the pace of change is just getting faster and faster and faster. And if you don't keep up, uh, or at least try to keep up, the next time you won't get a, a Lehman's uh, moment, you'll get, boom, API call and I, I, I think at that point we might have to agree to disagree. And, and, and if you look at UK Gov actually recently, when the, their Lord Select Committee around AI has yeah. come out and said we don't want to regulate it right now, um, but there's a lot of debate in the industry. Elon Musk says yes, we should right now because bots will kill us all. So, as a general view, I think um, we want to keep innovation from a technology perspective first. But you're absolutely right; we need to keep close to it because there is a big danger if it's not kept in check. I don't think, I think the opportunity for consumers is there to take advantage of this tech, but we need to, to manage it in an appropriate way, and industry needs to work with government as well, which is another theme of the, the, the conference today. I absolutely loved the conversation, and thank you so much for all of your attention to it. Ladies and gentlemen, can please say thank you to the panel. A uh, short time for questions before our final closing session. Uh, is there anything? Uh, oh, great. Thank you, the gentleman in the blue shirt. The uh, mic's coming to you. Steve Mather from Sci Hearing. Um, there's been no mention at all in the panel about the uh, requirements in PST2 around strong customer authentication. And I'm aware that they lag behind the uh, implementation of API. So I wonder if you could have a comment on what that means in this sort of intervening period, please. Yeah, sure. So um, for open banking, authentication responsibilities is delegated to, uh, because we've adopted a redirect model for the 2017 standards, is delegated to the banks. So the banks are ultimately responsible for performing customer authentication. But the definition of strong customer authentication won't come into effect until the regulatory technical standards are applied. What does that mean? Uh, if a bank goes live with an API first uh, model, are there risks, are there uh, issues with the, the uh, redirect and OAuth based model? Yes, there are. And those risks can be compounded if you go live with, uh, or a bank is providing services and authentication using credentials that are not phishing resistant. That is a risk. It's been called out um, several times to the um, by the security and fraud working groups. However, uh, it is not a mandatory or legal requirement until RTS goes live. Mm -hmm. Each bank has to manage that risk themselves. And, and, I, and I think it's important from a vendor perspective, you know, both, both Fordrock and ourselves, you know, have provided that technology. That technology is there and is available today for any organization that does choose to implement that. And knowing that it is coming down on those RTSs, the likelihood is that they are going to be implementing that. And, and you know, I imagine it's the same for, for, for Nick. But you know, everyone that we're working with, that is absolutely a critical part of, of the API conversations that, uh, that these organizations are having. And that's not only you know, here within the UK, that, that, that transcends Europe and, and, and you know, also in a place like Australia. Thank you. Any more questions from the team? Uh, there's a number of threads here, I'll just try to pull together quickly and then I'll finish with a question. Um, there's a bunch of pros and cons obviously uh, emerging with open banking and the cons particularly uh, will only emerge if there is significant uptake in the consumer uh, market. And uh, for me, the, uh, the combination of consent and authorization at both ends of the equation and the fact that there's potentially multiple organizations where you need to do consent and authorization suggests to me that there's going to be a user experience slash convenience problem for the consumers. How much of an impact does the panel think that's going to have on uptake of open banking <coughs> in the you know, coming months and years? It, it all comes down to the implementation. So I think when you, when you consider the, there, there are opportunities. And I think it's important to go beyond compliance. So it's not just about complying, it's about how you shape 
customer expectation. There are clearly open standards which enable consent-driven access in a, in a granular way to data. So when we look at, at, at user-managed access, UMA, there is a, there's a real opportunity for an organization to be able to develop trust because of the transparency that an individual consumer has with regards to their data. And so I think it's really down to the organization to step into that, that, that relationship and go beyond just traditional profile management and actually give them visibility into you know, their, their preferences, what's happening with their data, who can it be shared with, and to enable them to share it within the ecosystem for benefits of loyalty, for benefits of rewards, for easier payments, and then also to service their own kind of uh, community and their own ecosystem as an individual in who they want to share data with for their own value. Um, but it is, there, there are definitely challenges. There's no two ways about it. I think the opening up of data, whilst at the same time there is a very stringent regulation which is about the protection of data, the transfer of responsibility from data controller to data processor is all sort of to be defined, particularly as this comes into force. I think it's for organizations with their legal departments and their privacy office and, and then for the security office to really be defining how they're going to address that in reality because as we know it's, you know, it's, it's nearly upon us. And uh, you know, I think, I think the only challenge is going to come is when a particular consumer has given consent to two and a half thousand different TPPs and has allowed their marketing information to be shared with 8,000 different organizations. And when they want to go through and revoke that consent, what does the user experience look like at that point? And, and I think we have to consider that those are that is a reality that can occur. And in fact, you know, one of the things that people have been talking about is, do, do we end up with actually a set of consent management organizations that someone goes to really purely as this is where I'm going to do all of my consent management mm. rather than having to go through each every, every mm. single different yeah. organization who's asking me to provide consent. If I've already given my consent to Marriott, then why do I have to go through with British Airways and with Iberia and with everybody else that that information can be shared with, with Marriott. And I think that is something, as we talk about open everything, as these APIs become broader and broader, uh, then, then I think we will see organizations that specialize purely on consent. Yeah. And the key, just the final piece on that one, though, is uh, under... That suggests to be very brief. Very brief, very, very brief. The final piece that's underpinning all of this is identity. You can't do that without having a, con a single source of identity. How can I share this information? How can I uh, translate it? How can I, you know, know that Phil at Bank of uh, Bank of Ireland and Phil at Bank, uh, British Airways and Phil at, uh, you know, uh, RBS is the same Phil? So yes, it's all possible if you solve the individual identity problem. Thank you very much. Uh, a big hand for our panel. After questions, thank you so much. <laughs>